Welcome to ISTE 2012 here in beautiful San Diego, California. I'm Amy Rogers with ISTE Vision News. I'll be bringing you all the action from throughout the week. Registration is officially underway at ISTE 2012. More than 20,000 people will pass through the doors of the San Diego Convention Center just this week. Rehearsals were held Saturday to make sure everything is just right for Sunday's kickoff. Education policy is important, but education policy backed by leadership and incentive funding is a game changer. After taking to the stage, we caught up with ISTE CEO Don Knizek. It's really special to me that the conference continues to be strong. It shows to me that there is a, um, a true commitment and dedication by the educators um, in this nation and in the other 60-something that are attending to make sure that they've gained what they can in knowledge and skills in order to take back the best strategies to engage kids and to give them a world-class education. After a decade of leadership around the conference, you began to not notice some things as much as before. But I can already tell this time around, those things that endeared the conference to me even before I was in the leadership role, I'm beginning to notice again and appreciate and, and enjoy in a different way. Now coming up next, take a look at highlights from the affiliate annual meeting. Every single time people say, oh, the best thing about being an affiliate is each other, right? Talking with each other, building those connections, learning from each other, networking, collaborating, all those things happen with each other and with this deep back and forth, but that's not going to happen if you don't talk to somebody, right? If you stay in your corner of the world, you can, but you're going to get so much more if you get engaged, if you build your personal networks, if you stay paying attention to the listserv and this new cool tool we're going to have very soon. The 6th Annual Social EdCon Conference was held all day Saturday. It gave tweeters, bloggers, and networks, and many more, the opportunity to come together to discuss social media and education. What they ended up doing is uh, finding people's interests and then splitting people into different groups based on their interests. So it, it looks like it's going pretty well, and it's exciting to, to see people collaborating in different ways. It's always good to see whatever the latest technology is and whatever the latest spin on how to use it with kids. For all things ISTE, check out ISTE Central. It's located right here in the sales pavilion. They've got a bookstore and all the information that you'll need for the week. There are tons of hands-on workshops to check out here at ISTE 2012. We found one all about incorporating the iPad into the classroom. Take a look. Attendees broke off into groups and were challenged to use their iPad and the iMovie app to create a movie trailer in just 20 minutes. And this particular session is about transformational multimedia. It's about the students grabbing the iPad and filming stuff that not only will transform the way they think and learn, but hopefully help others by sharing that through social media. The educators that come to ISTE are some of the most innovative from around the world. And sometimes you're in a building in which no other teacher's doing what you're doing. But when you come to ISTE, you find that all these teachers are doing similar things or have the similar thought process about what technology and what good classroom management could do for education. Out of the back, homie. <laughs> That's all for now. Thanks for watching ISD Vision News. I'm Amy Rogers. We'll see you tomorrow. Incredible advances in technology have resulted in a world that is changing at a faster rate than it ever has before. This fast-paced change can be observed nearly everywhere, especially in the classroom. Technology has introduced new possibilities for teaching and learning. While this is a very exciting time for educators, it also presents some challenges. When there seems to be a next new thing every time we turn around, what best practices and learning models can teachers follow when selecting professional development and planning out their time in the classroom? Well, the things that I'm seeing that people are very interested in are iPads for education, how they can be used both administratively and in classrooms. And a lot of schools are looking at uh, how they can provide digital resources and digital equipment to all students and have a, one, a true one-to-one -one environment. And the solution is for students to bring their own technology to school. And how do you handle that? How do you work with teachers to manage that in their classroom? It's a totally different type of experience for them. Professional development is changing in the digital age. There's so many opportunities for teachers to access anything that they want to learn about. There's iTunes University. There are TED Talks. 
And even ISTE has a ton of great opportunities. We have webinars. We have, through our SIGs, they're offered a lot of free webinars. We have online courses at, at ISTE. There are many different opportunities for teachers to think about what it is they want to learn and then go for it. Online courses have proven to be a timely, affordable, and effective means for teachers seeking professional development. ISTE's online courses provide an interactive experience with content founded in the nets and developed by experts in the field of education technology. ISTE has a number of online courses that are available. There are learning labs for Web 2.0 tools and project-based learning, and then full-blown courses like nets for administrator, digital storytelling, and project-based learning. Professional Learning Networks, or PLNs, provide learners with connections that can contribute to one's professional development and knowledge. With increasingly limited time and resources, the benefits of a PLN are numerous for educators and education leaders. A professional learning network is a network of professionals and people that you're learning from and with whom you're sharing your knowledge. It's an opportunity for professionals to reach out to others when they need something or when they want to learn something. So I just can't imagine a teacher in this digital age not creating their own professional learning network and creating an opportunity to just become the best they can. A good place for educators to start in building their PLNs is with ISTE. ISTE has a lot of wonderful opportunities to connect with other educators. The ISTE Ning or the Conference Ning, LinkedIn, Facebook, ISTE has a lot of wonderful places to connect with other people and find out what they're doing. Coaches and others who help teachers integrate technology into the classroom are instrumental in the effective implementation of digital age skills. With the guidance of a coach, teachers can leverage the power of technology to engage students in their learning and help transform learning environments. Instructional coaching is where experienced teachers are working with other teachers in their classroom, providing on-site, just-in-time, job-embedded professional development. One of the most valuable parts of instructional coaches is that it gives teachers an opportunity to reflect on their teaching, to think about what has worked, what hasn't worked, and what they could do to improve. Recognizing the growing importance of coaching and education, ISTE is focusing more on developing coaching content and resources, including the recent launch of the Nets for Coaches. The Nets C are the standards for evaluating the skills and knowledge that education coaches need to guide and support teachers in an increasingly connected and global society. What helped me as an administrator when the Nets for Coaches came out was that there was a framework for other administrators to really understand what coaches do. Too often, we found that instructional coaches were in a kind of a limbo in their, in their school, and administrators didn't know what they were supposed to do, and teachers didn't really know what they were supposed to do, and they were left with this having to explain their jobs. And the Nets really helped frame their work and communicate what it is that coaches can aspire to. Many coaches come into the job thinking that they're there to fix the computers, to reset the printers, or help teachers with the technical details. And the, the coaching nets really elevates what coaching is all about, because it's, it's about teaching and learning. It's about creating a vision. It's about modeling digital citizenship. It's about creating professional development for teachers and helping teachers to really see what they can do best with technology. Despite limited funds and resources, ISTE members from all around the world continue to find ways to acquire the PD they need in order to transform education. Well, this year I've had the opportunity to visit a few countries. One was Uruguay, where the Plan Cebel is in, implemented to provide students with laptop computers in all the elementary schools throughout the country. 450,000 students have little computers. And the program is a social inclusion program where they're trying to help everyone join the digital age. We saw the same thing in Argentina. They have a program, Connect Our Egalidad. That program is for secondary students. They've implemented a million computers, netbooks, to students throughout the country in the last year. They pro both countries have provided a lot of professional development, personal lear learning networks, opportunities for teachers to collaborate, coaching 
to help them change their classrooms, their classroom practices. And it's really wonderful, wonderful to see a whole country doing a whole systemic approach. The fast-paced change of the digital age requires that educators continue to be lifelong learners. To stay effective and relevant, educators need to be proactive in their own learning by building support networks like PLNs and seeking out professional development. Well, teachers have to be model learners and as experienced professionals, they can learn from each other and they can set up their own professional development opportunities. I visited a school here in San Diego. The principal told us that he wasn't thinking much about professional development because he turned the professional development over to his teachers and it has been wildly successful because the teachers get to choose what they need to know and they go and fill those holes in. Each one of us has the ability to influence positive change for learning and teaching. Our impact on positive change becomes even greater when we work together. ISTE looks to provide opportunities where educators can support one another by sharing creative ideas, coaching, mentoring, or even just lending an ear as we all work to advance teaching and learning in order to expand student horizons. With education and the world changing so fast, it feels like we're all running a race just to keep up. And I think the only way that we can run this race is by holding hands and racing together. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage ISTE President Holly Job. Welcome to San Diego. It's a privilege to stand before so many educators dedicated to expanding horizons for students throughout the world. You are the reason learners today can have a hopeful outlook. Your willingness to invest in professional learning opportunities like ISTE 2012 and share your experiences with each other through your personal learning networks here at ISTE's annual conference and throughout the year is what will positively shape our collective futures. The ISTE board and staff look forward to this event year round because it showcases the energy and momentum that can be achieved through collaboration, best practices, and a shared vision for transforming education. I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank ISTE's board members who share their time and talents so generously and work passionately to serve ISTE's members and its mission. This year, we have five outgoing board members. And if you'd stand, wouldn't we do it? Um, Julie Evans, Howard de Blasey, Kara Gann, Dan Meyer, Helen Paget, and Eileen Lento, we want to thank you as well. Please join me in thanking them. I want to give a spe special thank you to our outgoing past president and my dear friend, Dr. Helen Paget. Can you also join me in acknowledging our other board, current board members and our new board members? Would you all please stand? And lastly, this conference would not be possible without our incredible partnership with Q. Let's show our appreciation for Q and Mike Lawrence, who is Q's executive director, and also an ISTE board member. I would be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge a former ISTE board member and volunteer leader, Susan Walkus, who passed away last week. She was such an energetic woman, a strong advocate, and a brave human being. We'll all miss her dearly. 
As we know, change is inherent part of transformation. And this past year, ISTE has witnessed its share of changes. One positive shift involves the ISTE Board of Directors' adoption of a new governance model. The Carver Policy Governance Model empowers board members to focus on the overarching vision of the organization and speak with one voice to help the organization fulfill its mission. This model also relies on powerful two-way communication channels with members. We look forward to increasing opportunities for our members to interact with board on a regular basis. As a kickoff, the board will be holding a session, ISTE Board Inside Out, What's Next for ISTE, on Monday at 11 o'clock to noon in room five. We encourage you to check it out. If you can't make the session, please make an effort to search out board members and talk to us in the hall. We do want to hear from you. Your voice matters. Not only does your voice matter, it can be heard around the world. ISTE continues its, to expand its global reach, and this year is no different. We are proud now to have 80 global affiliates and ISTE ambassadors in Asia, Australia, the Middle East, Canada, the UK, and South America. There are 62 non-US countries represented at the conference this year. Welcome, everyone. And speaking of global influence, influencers, and change, our own Don Knezik announced earlier this year he will step aside as Chief Executive Officer in September. Don has served the organization so ably the last 10 years. His passion for improving the lives of learners throughout the world will continue to have a lasting impact on the fabric of this organization. Let's welcome Don to the stage and give him the roaring round of applause he deserves. Don, you have played a critical role in helping grow ISTE's reach throughout the world. We are so appreciative of your many, many contributions and passion and look forward to working with you in new capacities in the years ahead. Thanks, Holly. And it has been quite a decade. You're right about that. But tonight, this audience is in for a special treat because you and I have some exciting news for them. Yes. As many of you know, the board engaged in an executive search firm associate association strategies to conduct a global search for ISTE's next CEO. This process was extensive and involved many. We had an incredible talent to choose from and are pleased to share with you that we have found our next CEO, Brian Lewis. Let's warmly welcome Brian to the stage. Some of you may have heard or read the news about Brian Lewis. I'd like to take a moment and highlight why Brian was chosen and why we are confident that he will help lead ISTE into the future. As you know, ISTE is a strong organization in an area of education that is undergoing rapid and deep transformation. Never before has technology been so valued as a teaching and learning tool. We are uniquely positioned to capture this moment and assume leadership in the future of educational technology and its access and use for students and, and teachers. Brian is an accomplished leader who can help us realize these objectives. Brian Lewis brings an important combination of experiences, extensive advocacy, communications, planning and management, and marketing and communications. 
He is a strong strategic leader with a proven experience in transforming education membership associations to bring greater value to the members and to the position and to position the organization for long-term success. Brian understands the educational community and its structures, issues, operations, and challenges, which will allow us to work with our colleagues on mutual issues and bolster strength in influencing state and federal policy. His strong relationships in Washington, D.C. will help us position the organization and our membership to have a strong voice in education policy discussions and decisions that impact education. We believe that we have found in Brian Lewis an energetic advocate for education with a vision for expanding and increasing the impact of ISTE, both in the United States and globally, to achieve our mission of improving educational opportunities for all children. Brian, we are delighted to have you with us. The first thing I need to do is to thank the ISTE Board of Directors. The recruitment process was brutal, uh, and they put me through the ringer. I am humbled and uh, deeply appreciative and incredibly excited uh, to begin this work, and I'm very grateful. Um, the other thing I need to say is that there's an awful lot of education groups out there that have been touched by Don in the last decade, and I've worked for a couple of them. And his reach, his support, his collaboration, is well known. So Don, thank you so much. And I just want to leave you with one thought. Harriet Rubin was the founder of Doubleday Currency Publishing in New York. And she has a quote that I use a lot. The board heard me use it. And I want to share it with you because it means a lot to me. And maybe we'll give you a little bit of insight into who I am. She said, freedom is a bigger game than power. Power is about what you can control. Freedom is about what you can unleash. I am so excited to begin partnering with you in continuing the great work of ISTE in unleashing the success of students around the globe. Thank you and have a great conference. Thank you. Thank you both. You will learn more about Brian Lewis in the months ahead because he'll be assuming his new role as Chief Executive Officer in September. We have him pretty scheduled to the max at the conference, but if you catch a glimpse of him, be sure to wave or say hello. Now I have the honor of introducing a linchpin in the world of educational transformation, Ms. Karen Cater. Karen Cater is the director of the Office of Educational Technology at the U.S. Department of Education. She has devoted her career to creating the best possible learning environments for this generation of students. Prior to joining the department, Karen directed Apple's leadership and advocacy efforts in education. In this role, she focused on the intersection of education policy and research, emerging technologies, and the reality faced by students and administration. Let's give Karen a warm ISTE welcome. Thank you, Holly. So I'm so honored to join in this kickoff of ISTE 2012 here in sunny and oh so pleasant San Diego. Congratulations, Don, and thank you for your years of leadership at the helm of ISTE. And welcome to Brian. I look forward to working with you along with your talented leadership team. So what unites us here today is our shared commitment to transforming public education for this century and expanding the opportunity to learn with the help of new and emerging technologies for every person, regardless of zip code. I stand here today with one message. Your work matters. It matters as you design new solutions. It matters when you engage in hackathons, plug fests, data jams, startup weekends, maker fairs, or design challenges. Your work matters every time you share, here at ISTE, at meetups or tweetups, or by blogging, speaking, or helping the teacher next door. 
your work matters as you design fresh learning opportunities, new assignments, new challenges, new interactions with students, leveraging technology because the world has changed and what they need to know and be able to do has evolved. Your work matters as you personalize the learning environment so that every single student has a chance. You are the innovators, the risk takers. You keep your ear to the ground, your eyes on Twitter. You click on the link, you read, you think, you listen, you engage, you personify learning. Figuring out the latest app, keeping up with the change, developing your personal learning network, and forever troubleshooting. This is education's internet moment, and your work matters now more than ever. So in Washington, D.C., over at the FCC, the agency that has funded the critical and extensive infrastructure for schools and libraries through E-Rate, we have a leader in Chairman Julius Jenikowski. Julius is fully committed to education as a national purpose for expanding broadband to all corners of the country. He is fully aware that we're all here today at this conference, and he sends this message. At the FCC, our mission is to harness the power of communications technology to promote economic growth, broad opportunity, and solutions to national challenges like health care, public safety, and education. Few areas hold more promise for broadband-enabled solutions than education. Simply put, high-speed internet, wired and wireless, is forever changing the way students learn and teachers teach. With broadband, any school library can become a portal to more information than the Library of Congress. Children living in the poorest and most isolated communities in the world can have access in their classrooms to the best teachers in the world. At the FCC, we've been working since the 1990s to seize the opportunities of the Internet for Education. Our E-Rate program has helped connect almost every classroom in America to the Internet. We recently adopted several important modernizations of the program, lowering the cost to schools and recognizing the potentially important role of mobile broadband. Thank you to ISTE for the work you're doing to improve education through technology across the globe. Working together, we can open new worlds of opportunity for students everywhere. Thank you. So, I don't know if you know, but we have a uh, pretty cool Secretary of Education in Arnie Duncan. So recently he held top trending spots on Twitter during the 2012 All-Star Celebrity Basketball game, despite the presence of NBA legends, movie stars, rappers, and comedians. But more importantly, Arnie Duncan is a focused listener. He's a continuous learner and an inspired leader. He couldn't be here today with us, but he did send this message. Hello, and thank you, Karen, for that kind introduction, and more importantly, for your tremendous leadership in this area. And I'm so sorry I can't be with all of you in person, but I am grateful for the opportunity to thank ISTE and each and every one of you individually for your innovative work and longstanding leadership. You show us how to make the best use of new and emerging digital technologies so that teachers, administrators, technology enthusiasts, and students can power up their learning and find more ways to connect with each other and with a broader world around them. Congratulations to Don Knizek for an outstanding tenure leading ISTE. Now more than ever, we need more strong leaders just like Don to guide the country in transforming education and vastly improving the opportunity to learn for every single American. President Obama has an ambitious agenda to reform our nation's schools, and technology has a unique and critically important role to play in this transformation by personalizing learning for both students and for teachers. To achieve this personalization, every educator needs to be connected with the best digital content, tools, and resources in order to enliven the learning environments for students and to fully connect with their peers and experts. We're building on the great work in the National Education Technology Plan that was crafted with tremendous support from ISTE. And let me tell you about a few of our initiatives. First, our new Race to the Top District competition invites districts to show us how they can design and implement a personalized learning environment 
we must take classroom learning beyond a one-size-fits-all mentality and bring it fully into the 21st century. And we aim to fund and learn from some powerful examples, including those that use technology to provide personalized learning and to keep track of students' progress. Secondly, we recently launched the RESPECT initiative, and we're working with educators to rebuild the teaching profession and to elevate and strengthen it. To support this work, President Obama has proposed a new $5 billion competitive program that would challenge states and school districts to work with teachers, their unions, colleges of education, and other education stakeholders to meet the needs of a new generation of teachers. And finally, today we're pleased to be announcing that August will be Connected Educator Month with a month of opportunities to learn together in vibrant online environments. We're excited that ISTE is joining us in spotlighting these opportunities to advance personal professional learning networks and support faculty everywhere. At our U.S. Department of Education, we're embracing technologies that support social engagement and change. Follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and sign up for our email newsletters. We want to engage with you, work with you, and support you. Okay, so there you go. You will be hearing more about Connected Educator Month in the days to come. So we're on the cusp of exhilarating advancements and new opportunities to learn. President Obama said the single most important thing we can do is make sure we've got a world-class education system for everybody. That is a prerequisite for prosperity. It's an obligation we have for the next generation. So your work matters. Your talents will power our economy, revitalize our society, and light the way to a bright future for each and every student that you reach. So thank you for your work. Here's to designing together, sharing together, innovating together, working and playing together. And here's to a high energy ISTE 2012. Thank you very much. Back to Holly. As we've been discussing, the role that educators play in expanding the learning horizons of students is critically important. This evening's keynote panel brings together diverse voices from both inside and outside education. Our intention is to provide a rich and textured conversation that presents us success stories and perspectives we might otherwise not get to hear. To moderate and frame the discussion, I would like to welcome to the stage creativity and innovation expert, Sir Ken Robinson. <clears throat> Thank you, Holly. How are you? Um, we've got a very interesting panel here, and uh, we don't have a lot of time. I think we've got about 45 minutes, um, and I'm going to speak for 43. <laughs> so it's all going to get a bit awkward, really. Um, <laughs> no, it's a fantastic event, this, isn't it? And it's a real, real pleasure to be here. H where are the people from Edubros? <laughs> where are you? Edubro, um, I was invited to your party tonight. I'm sorry I can't come. But I would, I would love to. I would love to. Uh, I was told I would be bought a drink. Um, I can't come, but if I could have the money, that would be great. That would be great. Um, I'm not, I have to say, I'm not a specialist uh, in technology. Um, but I do think the implications for the whole future of education couldn't be more profound. You know, uh, ten years ago, uh, I published a book called Out of Our Minds, Learning to Be Creative. This book is terrific. Really, <laughs> thank you very much. You'd be foolish not to buy a copy of this immediately. But with the following caveat, about um, 18 months ago, the publisher contacted me and said, we'd like to new do, do a new edition of the book. Uh, it being so marvellous, and uh, you know, we're going to do new artwork, a new cover, would you like to make any changes to the text? Well, it seemed to me improbable, frankly, that it could be improved. I mean, I thought, 
I thought, this is, after all, a masterwork, you know, that I composed myself. Anyway, I thought I'd take a look at it. I had, what I had in mind was a weekend with a spell check <laughs> and a bottle of burgundy. That was the plan. I actually rewrote the entire book from start to finish. Uh, uh, every chapter has been revised. There are two new chapters. The whole thing is completely new. Um, so if you bought the original version of the book, <laughs> I'm sorry, you, you and I have to buy this new book. But one of the reasons is that so much, the reason I rewrote it is so much has changed just in the 10 years. I mean, I was anticipating the changes, obviously. Um, I predicted the whole thing. But, but, but all kinds of things have happened just in technology in the past 10 years. I mean, 10 years ago, there were no iPads, there were no iPods, were there? iTunes was still a kind of faint idea. Um, there were no smartphones of any sort. Uh, there were no social media, really, 10 years ago. I mean, 10 years ago, there was no Facebook. Um, th there was no Twitter. I mean, 10 years ago, people didn't tweet, did they? I mean, if they did, they were discouraged. <laughs> <weren't they? laughs> people would say, what was that? You know, do, you, do you mind not doing that? <laughs> and if you have to do it, do it outdoors. We're trying to eat in here, you know. It's, but, but now, suddenly, it's a kind of social commitment. You have to tweet, otherwise you're kind of out the fray. Well, that's just in 10 years. Um, but if you look at the arc of technology over the past 50, of course, it's exponential. And if you, if, if you look at the booths and exhibitions around this conference, well, you'll know that the next 10 years are probably less predictable than the past 10 years were uh, when I wrote the book. So buy this book now, because 10 years from now, it'll be different. <laughs> that's the point. But the reason I say this is, is that technology is not the only driver. There are other drivers, and we might talk about them in the panel. But it's a really big one. And education really now sits at a very important crossroads, I think. It's very interesting to me that you know, the education sits in this curious place. It's one of the most contested areas of public policy around the world. Governments all around the world are trying to figure out what to do with education. It's never been a hotter topic politically. Um, and yet, more and more kids, as far as I can see, and teachers are becoming disengaged from the whole process as it currently is. And it's, I think, because there's a contradiction between the principles on which we should be basing education and those that determine public policy. And notably, although we talk a lot about it, the extent to which education becomes depersonalized, when it has to become the opposite. When I first arrived, I, I should say, by the way, some of you know this, I am not actually from America. You, you know that. <laughs> But uh, we live here now. Actually, we moved 10 years ago, 11 years ago, to Los Angeles, thinking we're moving to America. But it's, 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 it's very similar to America. It's a close, it's a short plane ride. But when, uh, when we were coming here, we were given well-meaning advice by people. And one of them was this. We were told that Americans don't get irony. Now, this is not true. I have traveled the length and breadth of this country. We live here. We're permanent residents. Uh, my daughter's coming, actually, uh, next week is taking her oath of allegiance as a citizen. We're all going to go down that route. Seriously. But it's not the case that Americans don't get around. It's one of those cultural myths, like the British are reserved. <laughs> we're not. I don't know why people think this. We've invaded every country we've encountered, <laughs> haven't we? We've, we've tried to dominate every culture we've come across. Why you think we're holding back, I have no idea. But, but <laughs> the one thing you cannot accuse of is keeping ourselves to ourselves and minding our own business. But, um, but I knew that Americans got irony. The minute I arrived in America and saw that legislation, no child left behind. Because I thought... Whoever thought of that title gets irony, <laughs> don't they? Because it's leaving millions of children behind. Now, I can see that's not a very attractive name for legislation. Millions of children left behind, I can see that. What? <laughs> that doesn't play well in the Congress, I can see it. What's the plan, Mr. President? Well, we propose to leave millions of children behind and 
and here's the strategy, and it's perfect. But it's not intentional. It's not intentional uh, because actually the aims of the SEA uh, Act are laudable. The problem is the whole process of education reform has been based on an impersonal approach and a suffocating culture of standardization. And what we need is the exact opposite. Can I ask you, how many of you have got children of your own? Don't, why are you clapping yourself having children? <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> All right. All right. How about two children? How, who's got two children? Okay. Well, look, let me make you a bet. And the rest of you have seen such children, haven't you? Small people. <laughs> I'll make you a bet. If you've got two or more children, I bet you they are completely different from each other, aren't they? You would never confuse them, would you? Like, which one are you? Remind me. You know. And the reason is that we are, they are, humanity is essentially based on the principle of diversity. We are hugely different in our talents, our passions, our interests, our motivations, and our aspirations. And it's why human culture is as vital, various, and diverse as it is, because it springs from this fountain of diversity within all of us. Obviously, there are lots of things in common. The irony is that our education systems are predicated on compliance and conformity, not on creativity and diversity. And there's another problem with the system, which is based on linearity. When our lives are not linear, they are organic. Now, I believe that there are opportunities now, um, as Holly has pointed out, with the new technologies as well, not only, but including new technologies, to do exactly what the Secretary is arguing for, which is to personalize education to every student in the system. And sometimes I hear people say, well, you can't personalize it to everybody. We can't afford that. And my answer is, we can't afford not to. Look at the cost of the current system. You know, one, in 30, uh, one in three kids who do not make it from the ninth grade to the twelfth grade. That's a catastrophe on anybody's reckoning. And at that point, you can't blame the kids. You know, if any business were losing a third of its customers every year, if a third of the planes that were manufactured dropped out of the air, you know, if, if a third of your doctor's patients died, you'd think, what well, is it me? You know, am I, you know, am I doing something wrong or could the system be improved? And I don't blame teachers, I don't blame superintendents. It's a systemic culture that has to shift. And I believe the opportunity now is in our hands to make the change, uh, partly through the new technologies, but also through a broader approach to the curriculum. And there are some things we want to talk about on the panel. There are really, these are the issues that we want to get into on the panel. Firstly, um, what does it take to truly engage students in their own learning? Because so many kids, even the ones who stay in the system, are disengaged. It's not true in every school, of course. There are wonderful schools and great teachers. But taken as a net assessment of the system, many people are disengaged from it. You know that. You probably were as you went through it, despite everybody's best efforts. So what does that take? Um, secondly, what are the roles of the new technology in doing this? And, uh, and what are the pros and cons? And thirdly, what are the implications of that for practice and for policy? And we've got a great panel uh, to help us think about this. Um, and there's a Q&A afterwards, by the way, uh, for those of you who want to come along to it. Um, so I'm going to bring the panel on. Uh, and they're each going to say something. And then we're going to have a conversation and open this up. Um, the, uh, the panel, firstly, we have uh, Sean Covell uh, from Qualcomm. Here is Sean. Um, <laughs> we worked out earlier that you could land a 747 on this stage. <laughs> it's the longest stage in the world. So, so well done for making it. We, none of us were sure that we'd actually get here from, from the side. But, uh, um, and we, Sean will say a bit about our own work later on, and the details are in the program, so I won't take your time on all the bows. Uh, secondly, we have Mark Prensky, uh, who's written extensively on these things. Thank you, Mark. If you could just pick up the pace here, Mark, that would help. Just run. <laughs> and finally, Mayim Bialik, who's trying to say. Welcome, you made it. <laughs> um, so the plan is this, that uh, each of the panelists is going to talk for a few minutes about their work, and then we're going to open this up into a fascinating conversation uh, on the issues that emerge from it. And we're going to start with Sean, if you would. Wow, 
What a hard act to follow. <laughs> You're fabulous. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. And on behalf of Qualcomm, I'm honored to be here today. For people all over the world, mobile is changing the way that we learn and live. It's Qualcomm's vision that mobile technology will aid billions of people and improve their lives. And not only their lives, but their families and their communities. Qualcomm is based here in San Diego, and we're honored that ISTE has chosen to hold its conference in our hometown. As you may know, um, Qualcomm is one of the largest employers in San Diego, with 23,000 employees around the world. For 25 years, Qualcomm's ideas and inventions have driven the evolution of wireless communications, connecting people more closely to information, entertainment, and to each other. For those of you not familiar with Qualcomm, it's highly likely that you use our technology every day. If you have a 3G phone in your pocket, then you're using Qualcomm technology. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Qualcomm is a 21st century employer, recognizing the importance of 21st century skills, collaboration, innovation, and critical thinking. And we believe that mobile devices help make all of this possible. Having spent more than $18.4 billion on cumulative research and development, Qualcomm's inventions have turned the ordinary mobile phone, used primarily for voice communication, into an extraordinarily powerful mobile computer, the largest information platform in the history of humankind. And let me just illustrate that point. People have more access to mobile devices than safe drinking water, electricity, and even toothbrushes. The number of mobile devices in use is expected to surpass the world population this year. The mobile phone is the most used device. In 2010, the average person looked at their phone 150 times per day. And it has, yeah, yeah and you just did, didn't you? <laughs> and it has a profound impact on our life. 1.2 billion people pay to receive news on their mobile phones. This number is more than all who pay for cable TV and three times bigger than the total paid circulation of daily newspapers worldwide. So what does that mean? That means there's an unprecedented opportunity to leverage humanity's most pervasive global platform to transform the quality of and access to learning and education. Mobile devices make all this possible and all the more personal with 24-7 connectivity. Mobile learning extends education beyond the physical confines of the classroom, allowing students to learn in new ways, access content, and collaborate with each other anywhere and anytime. It's important that you know Qualcomm doesn't sell directly into education. We're device agnostic, and we support the wireless ecosystem. We help drive the industry forward and believe that wireless technology can be transformative in education, opening up opportunities for learning 24-7. Wireless technologies have revolutionized the way that we as professionals work and have enhanced our ability to compete. However, as we benefit from these innovations, schools are being left behind particularly in mobile learning. So six years ago, Qualcomm developed an initiative called Wireless Reach. Wireless Reach supports a number of research-based pilot studies that focus on mobile learning and help to drive a 21st century skills environment in and out of the classroom. Our education initiative focuses on four key areas. The first is professional development for our teachers using mobile devices. The second is infrastructure to support an environment where every student has a personal device. The third are privacy and security issues so that we can ensure student data is safe and access to the internet is appropriate. Fourth, digital content and assessment that takes advantage of these powerful devices. We believe the future of education is wireless and we're not the only ones who think so. Here are some messages from our Wireless Education Technology Conference that we host every year in DC. 
Please roll the video. The technology has changed every single major organization and human endeavor, so it's going to change K-12. The imperative for us to provide a world-class education to our children, uh, many of whom are incredibly far behind, um, is significant, and educational technology allows us to do that in um, some particularly creative ways. We've always, in the U.S., educated our kids to the limits of the then-current technology. There's no question that today being digitally literate is essential to participate in our economy. Hopefully we're a little bit smart about appropriate, relevant, effective, and I think just as importantly, inappropriate, irrelevant, and ineffective uses of technologies to aid a whole wide variety of developmental objectives, including what we're talking about here today, those in the education sector. Asking ourselves, what do we know about using technology in education in developing countries, and especially what do we know about using it effectively? So for the third consecutive year, we're hosting the Wireless EdTech Conference, a unique gathering that brings together a diverse group of stakeholders, including leaders in business, K-12, higher education, and government, to discuss the next steps in developing the potential of mobile devices for student and teacher learning. This year's themes include what's happening now in mobile learning, what are the challenges, and how do we plan for the future from a policy educator, and business technology perspective. We hope you can join us in D.C. in October. Thank you for having me here today. <clears throat> Sean, can I ask you a quick question before Mark goes up? No. Okay. <laughs> can I ask Mark a quick question before you? <laughs> the, um, most of the changes in these technologies, I say, weren't really predicted 10 years ago. Uh, at least by, by me right. and, and others, actually. Um, and Qualcomm exists as, a, as an organization that generates kind of innovation which other platforms then use. So, so, so do you have a sense, I mean, there's no reason why you, you would, but, but do you have a sense, or the company, of where we might be 10 years from now? You're, you're, I mean, I was astonished by that fact that, did you say mobile, devote, the number of devices will exceed the world population this year? Yes. So 10 years from now, do you, I mean, how do you yeah. begin to think about that? Well, it's a bit like your book. It's hard to predict what it'll look like 10 years from now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, really, the advances that are happening um, just exponentially. You, you have mobile devices now that are as powerful as computers. So yes. 10 years from now, it's yeah. only what we can imagine. I, I think mean, I, you're looking at a world that's going to be connected almost everywhere that you look. It's not yeah. just your mobile phone, but it'll be you know, every appliance in your house and et cetera. Yeah. I mean, because one thing that strikes me is that, is that it isn't, the technological changes aren't linear, they're exponential too and organic. I mean, when the iPhone came out, you know, they built in the facility for apps and there are now millions of them. And one of the apps you can get on the iPhone turns it into a harmonica. <laughs> so if you get really, you know, depressed, waiting for a call to go through, you can play the blues. On... <laughs> and I can't imagine that Jonathan Ives and, Bill and uh, Steve Jobs, when they were developing the iPhone, thought it's really important that this phone can be turned into a blues harmonica. Because <laughs> who else is going to buy it? Because so what I mean is the user then adds to the exponential growth of the technology. Absolutely. So, so I, I just find it very interesting that as we start to think about the future, it's almost impossible even a year out to say what this might look like. Thanks so much. It's fantastic. And, and um, Mark Prensky, as you know, has written a lot about technology and education in particular and has a new book uh, about to come out. So, Mark, would you like to talk to us? Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I know you all want to get to my end, and I do too, so I'll go fast. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I believe that in this age of technology, one of the key questions, and maybe it's the key question for education, is this. What do we keep in our heads, and what do we delegate and outsource to our machines? And how do we find that balance? And that's what my new book, Brain Gain, is about, which Sir Ken has been nice enough to endorse. My perspective 
is that what's making us better is not brain science. Brain science is teaching us many things. It's very interesting, but it's not far advanced enough to help us learn what to do. What's making us better is connecting our brains to technology, but only if we do that in a wise way. So I've been thinking about digital wisdom, which is combining those things that our brains do better with those things that machines do better and trying to do it in the best possible way. Now, we've been experimenting in lots of ways to do this. Some agree, some disagree with some of these things. And most of this conference, my guess is, is going to be about those things that machines do better or are getting to do better. So I thought I'd focus a little bit on the things that the brain and humans do better. And what are those two things for teachers and students that the human, uh, I think for the foreseeable future, will do better? For teachers, it's providing empathy. It's understanding the kid, putting your hands on his shoulder, knowing how to help him or her know where to go. For students, it's passion. Machines don't have passion, and so the student needs that. So let's dig a little deeper into the slogans that we've been hearing. When we see, for example, expanding student horizons, I agree, but let's ask, why do we want to expand them? Not just because they're bigger. My view is so that the students can find their passion. They can see a wider place to look. When we see things like encouraging students' passion to achieve, we have to think, well, do we mean that achievement is everything and passion is kind of down there? Or do we mean, in my view, that passion is what we have to do first and that's what's going to lead us to achievement? When we see <laughs> developing students' passion to learn, do we mean learn about everything? And if that's our expectation, we're, of course, never going to get there. So I think it's really about teaching them to learn about whatever it is they are passionate about and to find things to be passionate about. So my view is that helping kids find and follow their passion is really the key to a 21st century education because that's what provides the motivation, that's what provides the learning, that's what eventually will get these people the good jobs that they like and I think in the long run provide happiness. Of course, how do we do it? Well, I think there are four things that I would encourage all teachers to do. The first, of course, is to listen. Because if we don't know the passion of every student, it's very hard to encourage it. And when I listen, I find that the passions are all over the place. So we really have to listen and ask about that. Or else what we get is what the kids call cellophane kids. The teacher looks right through them at the curriculum and at the test scores, and the kids become invisible. Second thing, respect. Today we have mutual disrespect. And I've been talking for a decade now about natives and immigrants, and one thing that's led to, of course, is lots of divisions and even wars that people fight over this stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that the war is over. The natives won. And our job now is to make peace and to move forward to mutual respect and to digital wisdom. In the new century, what we need is a new balance of things like top-down and bottoms-up, old and new, past and future, technology and pedagogy. Remember, a hundred years ago, we were ignoring half the world. The men were making all the decisions for the women. Well, thank goodness we got over that. And now we're better, yes. Well, guess what? We're doing it again. Because half the world is under 25, and all the educational decisions come top down. I think the next century is about changing that as well. We need to overexpect from our students. Today, student capabilities are far greater than they've ever been. They're not less. And what's making them better is connecting their brains to technology wisely. And lastly, and this is so important, we have to empower all teachers to dare to do what they know is right. Because my experience is teachers know what they want to do and what the kids need, but somehow somebody has convinced them that their job is just to cover the curriculum. Not. It's to bring our kids into the future equipped with the skills that will allow them to function and thrive in the 21st century. Now, that's scary, 
And they have to feel the fear. We all feel the fear, but they have to do it anyway. And the thing that's so important about that statement is that that's the definition of courage. So today's educators have to be courageous and daring because things are changing so quickly that even with technology, things that may have been great yesterday or even today, and since we're in California, I'll show you this, <laughs> grow old really quickly. <laughs> and just on a slightly more serious note, let's not forget that while technology can truly inspire and help our kids, and we all know that and we want to do that, used poorly it can do damage. So we'd better be careful and search for digital wisdom. Yes, it can be hard. Yes, it can be scary. Sometimes it can even be unpleasant. But we can do this, folks. So let's help our kids find and follow their passion so that they can thrive in the future. Have a great conference. Where did you get the picture of Arnold Schwarzenegger? Ah, uh, everything's on the internet. Because <laughs> he didn't send them to me personally, I can tell you that. <laughs> Let me ask you a quick question, Mark. You, I've seen Mark's new book and it's great. Um, you're arguing in the book, if I get you right, that this relationship between uh, human intelligence and technology is actually leading to a step change in the evolution of the human brain, that we are going to be different well, as a consequence, is that a fair summary? And metaphorically, some argue that it, it's actually physically, I leave that to the neuroscientists, but metaphorically, we can do much more. In, in, and that's what I try to show in 50, 100 different areas, every area of life, if we get the symbiosis right, we can do more than we've ever done. So it's that, as you say, it's that meeting point. Of it's it, that it? meeting point in getting well, it right. Well, we, we'll come back to that. Um, my aim is, you know, is uh, both an, an actress um, and a parent, and she's also a teacher and a neuroscientist. So we're just thrilled to have you here, Maya. Let's welcome you to talk, please. This is like Comic Con, <laughs> but with less Chewbacca bikinis. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sir Ken. Thank you to my fellow panelists. It's um, really an honor to be here at ISTE um, and to be part of a very, very esteemed and exciting panel. So thank you. And thank you for welcoming me to, to your community. Um, as, as Ken just gave away a little bit, you might be wondering what I'm doing up here. But um, in addition to coming from an acting background, um, I, I play a scientist on the Big Bang Theory, but I actually am also a scientist in real life. <laughs> so I, um, I, I earned my PhD in neuroscience from UCLA, and um, Bruin fans, thank you. Um, and since I've gotten my degree, in addition to having two young children and kind of starting up this acting career, um, I do actually teach. I've taught neuroscience um, in the homeschool community in Los Angeles every year since I've gotten my degree. I've also taught biology and, in, and I've taught chemistry. Um, I, I had a, I've had a love for, for learning and also an appreciation for teaching. I come from um, two parents who are teachers who had a combined 70 years of teaching in public schools. And um, I, I myself, I'm, I'm here as a representative of Texas Instruments um, Education Technology, but I'm actually, I'm one of those people for whom science did not come easily, a love of STEM did not come naturally to me, and it was during my years actually on Blossom when I was a teenager that I had an amazing teacher. I had a tutor who was then a student at UCLA, and as, as anyone who's a teacher or an educator knows, it can literally take one teacher to make a difference, and I... I am blessed to have, to have had one person in my life who took the time and had the patience and really showed me the beauty of, of a life as a scientist. And I was 15 years old when that happened and I'm forever grateful to her. And honestly, it was that experience and now my sort of public role as a scientist on television that really has, um, has inspired me to, to work with Texas Instruments. Who, who's, whose kind of responsibility it is not only to get amazing education technology into students' hands, but also to educate teachers and administrators about what that looks like. 
So um, in terms of why I'm here today, I will end here and let us kind of get on with, with the panel itself. Um, I'm here to kind of, I guess I'm, I'm sort of the outside perspective. I, I'm hoping to share my experience and my enthusiasm both as a student and as a teacher and also as someone who's really actively kind of watching the implementation of what it looks like to put technology into the hands of tomorrow's leaders, both from the student perspective and also the teacher perspective. So thank you for having me here. Um, I want to, talk, if we can, to talk a bit about this idea of engagement. Um, I was at a, a meeting in LA a, a few months ago. Uh, it was about two months. Do you care? Yes. When it was. I'll, 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 I'll check the date. Um, but it was a meeting of uh, alternative education projects. And these are projects that are designed to get kids back into education who've dropped out. Mm. And, and th there are a lot of people who've dropped out. Th they're all different, but what they have in common are they all use a personalized curriculum, totally individualized. Uh, there's a close relationship between the teachers and the students. The teachers are all well supported. There's a lot of practical work, a lot of project work, uh, and strong links with the community. What interests me is that this is called alternative education. And if all education were like that, then presumably these kids wouldn't have dropped out in the first place. So at the heart of this to me is, this, is the idea of personalization and engagement, which kind of precedes technology as an idea. Um, so I so suppose part of me is resisting the idea that technology is the answer to everything. It's clearly not. Um, but I'm interested in your thoughts on what bit of the equation technology speaks best to in education. <laughs> How about if I start? Yeah. Um, While so, Mark's thinking. Yeah. And my end. So through our wireless reach initiative, as I, I mentioned, we've, we've done a lot of these research-based pilot projects. And you know, one of the amazing things that we've found about the technology is what it does is it, it gives the students the ability to collaborate with each other. We have a, a project in North Carolina, Project Connect, and, and one of the key results from that project that was you know, improving student scores on their end of course exam by leaps and bounds was that it, it was allowing the students to teach each other. Therefore, they started mastering the content and their confidence was raised as they communicated to their peers. Their peers you know, felt more comfortable learning from each other as well. So I think it's part of that collaborative empowerment element that technology provides. I love that about it, is that they, they teach each other, don't they, mm -hmm. when they're using yeah. it. Um, I mean, I used to be involved in drama education a long time ago, and, and it, I suppose what, what I'm trying to figure out in my own thinking about this is, uh, in terms of education, what's new about the new technology? Um, because there are some principles of great education which the new technology also helps us with but that, you can, that were always present in great education, uh, like group work and collaboration. I mean, theater's about that. It's a collaborative activity. Um, and in many ways, these principles have kind of been bleached out of education by this remorseless culture of standardizing. I mean, I know you were saying, Mayim, that you, you do a lot of teaching now. Um, I mean, for you, I mean, what, are the, what are the kind of principles that drive your practice when you're teaching? I mean, and, and this, how relevant is the technology to that? Well, I mean, you know, I think, I think there's, there's people here who are probably a lot more qualified to answer that than, than I am, but what I will say worked for me as a student and what I try and do with my students, um, I think it's kind of what Mark touched on. It's, it's using technology in only the best ways possible to really kind of mine that passion and to mine the specificity of each child. So for, for some students, just learning to use, for example, you know, a graphing calculator. For, for some students, just the process of engaging with a teacher in the process of learning is the, the biggest part of the lesson. And for others, it's going to be, what are the practical applications? What can I do that makes me feel like I'm a doctor or I could be one? 
I mean, I think for me, as I mentioned, I kind of came late to the science world. I needed to be able to feel like there was a world outside of the classroom. Yeah. But I think the specificity is, is exactly what you're saying that, that many more people are trying to hit on. So I think there's not necessarily one answer, but we would hope that we're only using it to really mine that, that individual passion that I think Mark touched on. And you mentioned that teacher who turned you on to science. What, what was it about that teacher? Um, I mean, I think it was, it was several things. I think that from the community I grew up in, I went to public schools in Los Angeles, I, I never really saw myself as a female scientist. I never thought that was possible. Or, or a male scientist. Oh, right, or a male scientist. <laughs> <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> um, no, but I, I, think, I think that experience really touched on a much bigger, a much bigger concept, which was that in the wrong environment, a student will not have their best brought out. Yes. And that's absolutely true. I mean, my parents were English teachers, so I didn't come from a science background, but I have as much potential as yes. any other student. And I think also, you know, part of why I'm so thrilled to partner with TI is I'm putting a female face on yes. STEM. I'm putting a female face on a love for and a passion for technology. And a lovely face it is. <laughs> the, um, I would say two things. It extends people so that the capabilities that students have today are so much more incredibly broad than they ever had in the past. They can literally reach out to other people around the world, to experts. They can talk to each other in new ways. They can create things. They can make things. That's never been possible. The second thing it does, though, is it empowers them. Because one of the things that we've been thinking about here is when we say everybody's different and everybody's an individual, we're thinking about often an individual way to do the same curriculum for everybody. But in fact, what we really need to do is everybody needs to have a different curriculum based on what their interests are. Maybe get to the same place eventually if we want to define that. But that's something that we can do now because we can say Follow your passion, and in when you do that, if you need to know science, if you need to know neuroscience or languages or all this, now we have ways to let you learn those when you really feel the need for them and when they feed your passion. Yeah. So I think those are the two biggest. The one, the one caveat I'd add to that is that um, I, I published a book a couple of years ago, uh, which is as good as out of our minds, and it's called The Element how finding your passion changes everything. And I'm, I'm a strong advocate of that. I mean, it seems to me that a lot of people will never discover the things they're good at. I mean, as, I, as I argue, the, the, the being new element is two things. It's first, it's finding things that you're naturally good at. Um, but it's not only that, because lots of people do things they're good at, but they don't really care for them. You know, they just do it. And many people do jobs they're good at, not because they like it. They just happen to be, they've wandered into it. To be new element, you have to love it. And if you love something you're good at, then, as I say, you never work again. So I'm, I'm a passionate advocate of passion, so to speak, in education. My, the caveat I have is that, um, that you often don't know what you're good at or that you may be passionate about something because you've been introduced to it in the wrong way. If it's not even on the curriculum. I mean, for example, one of the consequences of No Child Left Behind, unintentional consequences, I'm sure, uh, but nonetheless real, is that Schools throughout the country have cut out or cut down dramatically on arts programs. So kids can now go through the whole of their education and never pick up a paintbrush, never play an instrument, never be in a play, never dance on stage. I mean, that's a catastrophe. Because for many of these people, well, thank you, but, you know, you know I mean, if, if you've never done that, how do you know that you could do that? How do you know that would be a passion? If you've never encountered this teacher, how would you know? And so it is that stewardship uh, towards passion. And the reason I'm saying it, I know sometimes people think, oh, on top of everything else, I've got to find my passion now, really? Um, <laughs> like, like another checklist thing to do. Um, there's a degree of connoisseurship around that, isn't there, to help people find it. it it's why I'm sort of, I suppose, searching for this relationship between the technology and great teaching that you've been able to touch on. Well, I, somebody put it a fantastic way just the other day, this is a man named Jim G, and he said, if we think of the Pareto principle, where there are only going to be 20% at the, at the very top of anything, that it's really important that every single person find the affinity group into which he or she can fit into the top 20%. 
And so that's really what it means. And that's why expanding your horizons is so important, because you need to find that affinity group where you can do it. Now, on the other note to what you just said, one of the great things that I've lived my life by is that if, if there is something that you don't like, for God's sake, don't get good at it. <laughs> Yes, and there are ample opportunities for that in education, aren't there? That's right. <laughs> Can I ask you, just at the personal level, Sean, if you don't mind, in front of all these people? <laughs> I mean, Depends how, on what it is. How did you get drawn to this field, for example? And were, were there people in your life, as Mayim said, the were in hers, who helped to reveal to yourself well, your own interests and passions? I've got a confession to make. I'm not a neuroscientist. <laughs> You're not? <laughs> So my, my path was more political science, and um, for Qualcomm, I'm in the government relations department, so more policy and regulatory. Yes. And but were the teachers in your life that, that inspired Absolutely. you? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I, and I was actually one of those students who loved school. I mean, my parents would drag me kicking and screaming away from school every day. Yeah. I loved it. Loved learning, loved the opportunity. Yeah. Was your house that terrible that they <laughs> <laughs> Another I, story. I, I think, by the, that, to me, that, this is an important point. I mean, I, I rail to some degree against uh, our current systems education, but it's not that they don't serve everybody. They do serve some people. And there, there's a lot of room for improvisation within the system itself. But they don't serve everybody, and they were never intended to. Uh, and I think, latterly, the problem is they've become so overlaid with this culture of standardization and compliance that's that's uh, made matters worse. But I do think that um, the system has got to change, and it is changing, and it's inevitable that it will, because it's a bit like we were saying earlier, it's a bit like the publishing world holding out against e-books or the music business trying to resist iTunes. Sooner or later, the use is going to kind of overtake us, um, and it will be transformed anyway. I mean, do you not agree that that's yeah. the, the trend anyway? I mean, if, if we've now got more digital devices than people, <laughs> well, I think, I think that's one of the exciting things that devices can do, and I, I agree they should only be used for the best, is that you know, they, can, they can help teachers um, individualize learning for students. You, know, you can see if a student is getting the content, you know, who, who's got it, who's you know, in the middle, who's really struggling, maybe needs some more attention, more problem sets, etc. So it provides that individualization. Yeah, I, I think also I'd like to add, you know, as much as things will unimaginably change, um, as much as, I mean, I'm only 36, and even I remember when, you know, when I started at UCLA, no one had a personal computer. We would check our email from literally the, the middle of campus had a couple computers and you could log in. I mean, the world has changed so much in the past 10 years, 20 years. But I, I'd like to point out, I think the heart of learning is never going to change. One student and one teacher making one connection, inspiring a student, connecting, showing them something that they couldn't think of or couldn't imagine for themselves, that will never change. You know, there was um, there was a, a, a book published, uh, I think a year or two ago anyway, by um, uh, a lecturer at the Rotman School of Design in Toronto. It's called Artistry Unleashed. And I did a little blurb for it because, I mean, I, I feel that, you know, that, that teaching is the heart and soul of education. And it's something that's too often overlooked. You know, that very often politicians focus on the curriculum, on standards, on assessment systems, on testing. And teachers are seen as they're in the role of kind of delivering this curriculum. I don't know when this delivery language starts to get into education. I think we should get rid of it. Um, because in the end, it's, it's, it's that relationship. It's about, it's an art form to teach. Um, I remember years ago, my, my, when my daughter was school, she wasn't doing well in French. And I remember speaking to the French teacher, and I said, what do you think the problem is? And she said, well, she seems bored all the time in my lessons. <laughs> So I said, do you have any theories about this? <laughs> and she said, how do you mean? I said, well, could it be boring? I mean, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, just putting it out there, you know, as a thought, you know, while we're exploring on options. Anyway, the, the, the artistry, artistry and leash, they were looking at artistry in all sorts of professional settings. And one of the people who's featured in the book uh, teaches horsemanship. And he talked about this woman who came, been with him for a while, and 
uh, learning to ride. And uh, she came in one day and she was really flustered. And he said, what's, what's the problem? She said, I don't know. But I, he, she said, I took this horse out yesterday and it was fantastic. It was beautifully behaved. It was wonderful. Great ride. And I took it out today. It did all the same things. And it was all over the place. And he said, well, maybe you were riding yesterday's horse. Mm. And I think it's beautifully put because... It, with human systems, with living systems, you always have to ride today's horse, so to speak. And you know you can do the same lesson today and it doesn't work tomorrow. And that's the artistry of teaching, the judgment. So to, so to me, the, the kind of conversation is where does, the, where does the technology enhance that or improve it or extend it? I mean, what's your thoughts well, on that? My sense is that, that what Mayim said is absolutely right, but it's with a slightly different metaphor which is the metaphor, there's one metaphor of giving kids something, of, of showing them something, teaching them something. The other metaphor is coaching them to find what's in them and make it better. And the coach never has to be as good as the kid, as, as good as the performer eventually, but the coach has to have that, that ability to look at what the, the coaching needs, what the student needs, and provide it and let them get better and better and better and encourage them and then take pride in the fact that this person has gotten so big. And I think that's what teachers have always done uh, with their kids. But I think now it has to be more of a coach and less of a deliverer. Can I say, please, yeah. Um, I just want, can I can just change track here for a minute? Because there's another big theme. You know, we can't get through all of these, obviously, but... Uh, but there are some critics of the use of new technology and some serious reservations about them. I mean, for example, that uh, our children are spending far too much time with them. They're becoming too easily distracted. Uh, that they're uh, becoming obsessed with them. I mean, this, your estimate of 125 times that people look at their phone. I mean, my wife will tell you that's a modest estimate of how many times I look at mine. But. <laughs> But, um, but it is true I mean, that our kids have grown up with these things, as you said, as, as digital natives, and they, to them it's second nature. I mean, somebody once said that technology is not technology if it happened before you were born. And our kids don't think of this as unusual, it's just a, a, a utility. But so much exposure, I mean, you showed the picture there, Mark, of, of the infant over an iPad. Some people are concerned about that. I mean, is, is it doing something to our brains? Is it affecting our levels of attention? Is it affecting how we think negatively rather than positively? I mean, I, I think you're an optimist around this. I mean, is that, is that true? I mean, do you, and I want to ask Mayim as well. If <laughs> and you know, and I know, I know Mayim has, has, has with your, with your neuroscience on, on this, this, you wouldn't mind. Um, which, which is important. I think that what I showed with the turtle is that there are some things we do have to be concerned with. One of the things that I am concerned with is that we have no idea what putting a phone next to your head for your whole life will do to your brain. It's got, it's, we just don't know. And so if, if I don't do that, I use, I use the speaker phone and, and the, or an earphone. And I think that's something we have to be cautious about. And I think many things in technology we need to be cautious about. On the other hand, we live in a screen age. We live in an age where everything is going to be delivered to us through screens. But that age might not last forever. We might live in a hologram age in 10 years, as you said. But for right now, that's the way it happens. So the idea of kids spending a lot of time with screens is like, yeah, that's the time they live in. So it, that doesn't concern me in that sense. I. I <laughs> You're kind of putting the neuroscientist on the spot here. Um, you know, I think I, I will turn to the American Academy of Pediatrics and those kind of organizations for what they recommend for, for the developing brain in the first um, several years uh, for kind of the, the medical opinion on that. And I think uh, in terms of developmental neuroscience, I absolutely think we should be concerned, we should be thinking about these things, and we should also be deciding why and how we use technology. But I think that being said, I think all of our interest is on finding appropriate technology for the maturing brain. And, you know, in terms of what I do with TI, I'm working with the older brain. I got my first Texas Instruments calculator when I was 15 years old. 
And that kind of technology for me lasted me all the way through college and graduate school. So for me, that's a technology that I needed to be able to succeed and to, to gain a position in, in the STEM world. So that's just one example. But I think in terms, I think we can get a little bit hysterical with kind of thinking about, you know, monitors for infants when I think what we all share an interest in is really optimizing learning and education, both from a student and a teacher perspective in an age appropriate, mature fashion. And I would just add to that as well, um, you know, I, I don't think anyone would advocate the use of screens as babysitters, so to speak. You know, the idea that you're just going to put your child in front of a screen and three hours later, you know, give them dinner. But, you know, when you can use this technology to engage them where it's interactive, then I think that's where it becomes interesting and useful. So can, can I see all three of you, how do you... How... If you were to project forward, what, what do you see is the, the real implication for these technologies for an individualized education? I mean, if I, let me break it down a bit for you. Um, I mean, there are different, obviously different processes in education. One of them is the curriculum, which is what it is we want people to learn. Um, and in the standardized curriculum, we tend to see a narrowing of that, of, of uh, whole disciplines being thrown out uh, in the interest of standardizing um, and, and kids withdrawing from it. I mean, it just it reminds me, uh, about 20 years ago, 30, um, when I was younger anyway, uh, in my 20s, and I was, I was once, and, and looking groovy, I, I, I went round a slaughterhouse uh, in Liverpool. I don't know why. I, I just, I think I was taking a girl out, I don't know. You know but I know how to treat a woman, you know, so I... But we went around this place, and it, they, uh, they slaughtered, uh, I think, like 3,000 animals a week. It's what helped me become a vegan at one point. Um, but the real point was, at the end of the whole um, facility, there was uh, a door that said veterinarian. And I thought, well, he must be depressed. <laughs> <laughs> Another dismal week at the abattoir. And I, and I said... What do you have a veterinarian for? And they said, well, he comes in once a week to conduct random autopsies. I thought, well, he must have seen the pattern by now. <laughs> you know, <laughs> another 3,000 dead cows with a hole in their head. There's something, there's something happening in here. I don't care what you say. <laughs> what I mean is if you design a system to do something and it does it, you shouldn't be surprised. And if you design a system based on the principles of conformity and compliance and standardizing, don't be surprised if that's what you get. But if you want to reverse it and design a system that's based on personalization and individualization, it seems to me it has implications for the curriculum, for teaching, for assessment and everything else. So if you were to project forward, we're going to have to wrap up in a moment, but if you were to project forward, I mean, do you have a sense of, of where this road might be taking us, what education might look like in the next, I don't know how far ahead you would care to, to think. I know you're involved in, in the homeschooling movement. And more I mean, and more people yeah, I, I, again, I, will, I, I would imagine there are people far more qualified yes, to please. answer that probably sitting in this audience or up here on this panel. Um, you know, I, I have a, an almost four-year-old and a six-and-a-half-year-old, so I, I honestly, I don't know what it will look like. Um, I, I, don't, I, I know what I wish for my boys. I think it's what we wish for all of our children and, and for all of our students. Um, I'm also a vegan, so I'm trying to process everything you just said about all those cows <laughs> being slaughtered. Um, no, but I think, you know, again, I, I will go back to sort of, you know, what I, what I mentioned in my last comment. I, I want my children to, to have a full variety of, of understanding of what they could do, um, all of the, the technology needed to get them where they want to be, and also the freedom to live a life where they are both skilled in technology and free to reject it if that's what they want to do when they're adults. Thanks, Wayne. No. Uh, I'm, I'm very concerned about curriculum. I think that that's actually perhaps the, the most important thing we have to work on. And my next book is going to be called Zero-Based Curriculum, which said if we threw everything off the table, what should we still teach? And I'm particularly concerned not for the 15% or so at the top, because uh, your kids, my kids, lots of people's kids who are, who are very bright will get there almost no matter what we do. They'll find what they need and they'll, they'll get it. What, but that leaves 85% of our kids. And that, in, the, in the U.S., that's 40 million or more kids. And that's a lot of kids. And I don't think we know what to do with the kids in the middle or at the, in those kids who are not at the very top. 
I, we, because the jobs are changing so quickly? Are they going to be support roles for professionals? What are the jobs going to be? So we have little idea of how to prepare these people. And that's, to me, the biggest thing that we need to be thinking about. Sean. Um, yeah, again, acknowledging that I, I agree that there's many of you in the room who are better uh, suited to answer this question. I would say that um, my hope would be that technology, and specifically mobile technology, could be an equalizer. You know, it really, I think, you know, you're right. There, there's a certain group of people who they're going to have the strong parenting, they're going to have, you know, the top schools and the resources to succeed. But for the large amount of students who don't have that, I think, I think technology and, and wireless access can really you know, help them connect better to their teachers. It can give them a resource to go find information that they are interested in and maybe become passionate about. So that would be my hope. And I think that's, if I just say, just to wrap this up, I think that's, that's also true at the global level. Um, I was meeting <coughs> recently at the X Prize, looking at um, ways of extending literacy and numeracy in the, the so-called developing world. I mean, there are major problems, obviously, in the U.S., but I think there are 62 countries here, aren't there, represented at the conference. And uh, many of these under-25s that you pointed to in your slide, Mark, of course, are in the emerging economies, not in the, the old economies, so to speak. And, and the proliferation of mobile devices across those countries is huge and spreading quickly. And they're leaping across a lot, you know, a lot of the technology that we had to get through first to get to that. So I think the, the real implications are global in character and, and profound and far-reaching. And I think it's actually just, if I could just say to Istia, I think it's great that you decided to start the conference off with this particular session. I mean, I say, we always have to say that this is the beginning of it, not the end of it. But I know Istia is devoted to these issues. And I think, as the Secretary said, Arnie Duncan said, this is important work. It needs to be taken more seriously by government, I think. Um, and certainly much more seriously by the profession. But can I thank Maim and Mark and Sean for their contributions? We're going to be upstairs, and thank you for coming. And Sir Jim. Thank you very much. And there's a question and answer session upstairs, if uh, those of you have the appetite for it. Uh, the rival is, of course, a drinks reception, so it's entirely up to you how you do that. But, uh, <laughs> but thank you so much. Thank you.